Earth is in danger. After undergoing several destructive transformations and battling the Earth's mightiest defenders, Super Buu seems unstoppable. There was a glimmer of hope, however, in Son Gohan. The young man has undergone 28 grueling hours of ritual before the old Kaioshin, unleashing his potential. Surely he was enough to destroy Majin Buu now, but his arrogance and overconfidence at this sudden jump in power got the better of him, and Super Buu got a chance to absorb Gotenks and Piccolo. Now, in a desperate move, the old Kaioshin has given up his life so that Goku can return to Earth and use the sacred Potara earrings to merge with Gohan in order to create the ultimate fighter. In the original manga, Gohan could not catch the Potara, but what if he could? This is where this story picks up. Goku appears at the battlefield, cutting Super Buu in half with a Kiansan, and wasting no time, he throws the earring to Gohan. The half Saiyan nearly misses it, but catches it just in time. Super Buu wasn't about to let this happen, and a small piece of his body scurried around to try and jump at Gohan. But as it tried to absorb him, Gohan's body swung towards Goku's, a blinding light merging the fighters together, as Super Buu couldn't do anything but watch in horror. This power was incredible. Father and son combining, combining their, their forces, forces to, to defeat, defeat you, Super Buu. Buu. You, you can, can call, call me Gokuhan. Not the greatest name, I know. In an instant, Gokuhan appeared before Buu, and El put him in the stomach, sending him flying halfway across the world. Born from the product of Ultimate Gohan and Goku, how strong would this fusion be? As a personal Vegito superfan, I like to think that he will always be the strongest when placed against this hypothetical fusion. There's evidence to this. The old Kaioshin, when Goku and Vegeta first fuse, is extremely impressed by the power as it seems to exceed his expectations, explaining that their rivalry is surely helping Vegito's power. The Spanish guide El Manga Legendario, or the legendary manga, doubles down on there being some kind of rival boost for Vegito. And above that, it even claims that if Gohan and Goku were to fuse, it's probable that they could not have reached this same level. However, it's not really cut and dry. The rival boost isn't something really tangible. The super exciting guy describes the Potara as being an A times B multiplier. Looking at it from that perspective, a fusion between Goku and Gohan should be stronger simply because Ultimate Gohan is significantly stronger than Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta, so it's not a perfect answer. Just remember that an official guide does say that it doesn't seem like they would have the same level of power. Either way, Goku Hunt stomps. Without Gohan to absorb, Butenks stands no chance against the new fusion. Goku Han's aura is a mix of silver and gold, swirling around him like a thunderstorm of power. Unlike Vegito, who was very cocky and played around in order to get absorbed and save the others, Goku Han is a lot more serious. Of course, he may be sure of himself, just as Gohan was, but he's also aware of how dangerous Buu is. Gohan took him lightly. He let that power get to his head and nearly paid the price. The fusion knows a little better. Goku Han taunted Super Buu into attacking, with the Majin bursting forward, but the fusion was far too quickly for Buu, ramming him into a wall. Super Buu begins to create a blast to push him back, but instead steam pours out of him. Gotenks had defused within Super Buu. Whatever chance to win he had before means nothing. Goku Han continued to attack and slam Buu around. There was no Super Saiyan needed, especially considering that Gohan was an ultimate when they fused. But the only thing Super Buu could think about was absorbing and obtaining that power for himself. The piece of his body that he used to try and absorb Gohan began to move around more. He needed to get any advantage he could, finding Tien on the ground. Super Buu was finally knocked to the ground by Goku Han, who floated above the smoke telling Super Buu that this is over, cupping his hands together to charge a Kamehameha. But before the smoke could dissipate, a giant tri-beam came the fusion's way. Goku Han avoided it swiftly, turning to see that Super Buu had absorbed Tien. His body was sizzling, clearly hurting himself with the tri-beam. Even so, the power-up was negligible. Super Buu was just desperate, firing more blasts, which Goku Han easily evaded, surprising Buu by appearing and disappearing at different places, confusing using Buu until he screams out and fires an even more powerful tri-beam, predicting where Goku Han would be. But he was wrong, as instead he appeared behind Buu and teleported him in front of the Kikoho. Buu was buried in the crater, as Goku Han descended down with a smile. Super Buu struggled to regenerate, as Goku Han stood before him ready to end it all with a final blast. But Buu yelled out for him to stop, that he still has Goten, Trunks, Piccolo, and Tien within him. If he kills them, 
they will die too. Goku Han stops for a second. This is true, but he remembered seeing Dende and Mr. Satan before, who were now peeking over the edge of the crater. And though they are stone right now, because of the earlier wish to revive those killed at the tournament, the Namekian Dragon Balls were ripe for use. Goku knew the location of New Namek. It would be too risky to try and save them. This hurt him, but the sake of the universe depends on this. He continued to charge, but it was just a distraction for Super Buu to use pieces of his body to try and eat Goku Han again. But the fusion simply smirks, powering up and burning off the piece of Buu, not even making it past his aura. Suddenly, however, a power landed on Earth. Both fighters turned to sense who that could be. Super Buu's eyes lit up. This was his chance. This guy could be his ticket to gaining more power and actually being able to compete again. In desperation, Super Buu tried to unleash a solar flare, but Goku Han snapped forward and poked his eyes before kicking him up to the sky. The monster stops himself mid-air, bursting towards the new power's location. Goku Han simply sighs next to Mr. Satan and Dende, petting B with a smile, before disappearing. The power they felt was Vegeta, who had just arrived on Earth with Uranai Baba, but he pushed her back as soon as he felt someone come their way. Vegeta burst into Super Saiyan 2 to face Super Buu, even if he knew he stood no chance, because he could feel an even more incredible power elsewhere. It didn't feel like Kakarot though, or maybe it did. Super Buu laughs, a mass of his body slingshotting towards Vegeta, but Buu cocked an eyebrow. Why was Vegeta not bothered? The Saiyan let out a chuckle and just ducked to the ground. A ginormous Kamehameha from the atmosphere came rushing in, the blue surrounded by purple lightning. Goku Han floated over the world, firing the strongest father-son Kamehameha. Super Buu's eyes widened, as not only was the blob destroyed, but the entirety of Super Buu was as well. He tried to move out of the way, but the Kamehameha bent ever so slightly to reach the monster, dissolving him completely. The threat was gone and Goku Han had won. As the blast dissipated, Goku Han smiled while looking at Earth. He then teleported to Vegeta, and before he could ask what was even going on, he grabbed his arm, gathered Dende and Mr. Satan, and teleported away. Vegeta yelled at him to explain just what was going on. Who was he? Where was Kakarot? But then he turned around and realized that he was surrounded by Namekians. This was new Namek. Murray had collected the Dragon Balls as he had been watching the battles on Earth and hoped that he would be able to help their Earthlings friends. They wished for the planet to return to normal, for those killed by Boo to be revived, and finally for everyone to forget about this whole ordeal. To his own surprise, Vegeta was returned to life, and the fusion thanked everyone before returning to the lookout on Earth. The newly revived fighters run to hug their heroes, but they realize that this is neither Goku nor Gohan, it was someone else entirely. The fusion says who he is, and that it's permanent, so they better get used to it. Videl and Chi Chi look at each other in horror before bursting into tears. But Goten and Trunks, on the other hand, think this is really cool. Vegeta is angry, because surely a fusion between Goku and Gohan would rather use his time in the time chamber to study rather than train. Goku Han laughs at the chaos, but the fusion undoes itself right then and there. It seems like it wasn't permanent after all. The Dragon Crew is reunited, and peace returns to Earth once more. The what if could end right then and there, as things would theoretically go on as normal. But I I do think there is a few changes that would happen, and some that I think would just be fun. For one, neither Uba nor Majin Buu are around, as Goku didn't ask for Buu to come back someday as a good guy. Gohan's outlook in his role in the universe is also changed. It wasn't that he failed and his father had to save the universe with a spirit bomb like in the original, leading him to think that he can always count on Goku and the others. This Gohan played a critical role in defeating Buu, and through this experience, he was able to further understand his father's mindset on fighting and training while Goku understands Gohan's sense of justice a little better. Though he respects that his son doesn't want to always be fighting, he encourages him to become a beacon of hope. Thus, Gohan trains more than in the original story. It's nothing crazy, he isn't progressing greatly without someone to look forward to as a goal. Plus, he's still incredibly busy with school. Even so, it's more than in the original. Thankfully, Vegeta did give him the idea of studying and working in the 
Time Chamber. When we reach Battle of Gods, there is no Boo to truly anger Beerus. Vegeta is stressed out the whole party, but he's able to keep the peace, with Goku also showing up when he realizes that a fight wasn't going to go down. At the end of the party, however, Whis reminds a somewhat intoxicated Beerus about why they came here in the first place. The Super Saiyan God. Beerus cocks an eyebrow as his ki begins to rise, with Goku telling him to wait and that he has an idea, begging Oolong, who won the bingo tournament, to let him use the Dragon Balls this one time just to ask Shenron a question. Once they find out about the Super Saiyan God from the dragon, Oolong tries to make his wish, but the scared dragon ignores him and the Dragon Balls spread. The battle against Beerus shows us a rare battle at night, with Goku's Super Saiyan God pushing the story forward as usual. As you can see, these arcs don't really have that many big changes, which is why I decided to make this story a one-shot. I have done various stories where Gohan trains seriously, and though fusing with his father would make him want to train more, it doesn't exactly make him want to be the strongest, so he doesn't become the main character. During the resurrection of F-Arc, Gohan easily deals with various Frieza soldiers, terrifying the likes of Tagoma and Shizame. Gohan isn't playing around, he can't rely on his father to save him every time, and this time, they are alone. Goku and Vegeta trained at Beerus' planet and they were struggling to get in contact with them. It was up to him. Frieza was impressed by the new fighter, whom he did not recognize. A common stranger knows my name. You may not recognize me, but I'm no stranger. I fought with you on Namek years ago. What? You're that little brat, aren't you? In the blink of an eye, Gohan appeared before first form Frieza and struck him in the stomach, actually hurting the Emperor. The fight against Gohan is a lot tougher for Frieza than he expected in his first form, as Ultimate Gohan is able to push Frieza into his final form, ensuring that Piccolo is safe during the arc. But be it as it might, Gohan realizes that Frieza is far too powerful after all those months of training. He wants to prove himself to his father, he wants to beat Frieza on his own, but it was that kind of hubris that nearly doomed Earth before. He had to swallow his pride. In a desperate move, Gohan exploded his aura to the max, charging a powerful Kamehameha at Frieza, which the Emperor caught. He laughed. Was that all this kid had? He was an interesting fighter, so he deserved to at least see what he had in store. While holding the blast back, Frieza burst into his new evolution, Golden Frieza, pushing the blast back, knocking Gohan to the ground, and stepping on his chest. But the point of the Kamehameha wasn't to defeat Frieza, but to get Goku's attention. That's when Frieza was kicked into his own spaceship as Super Saiyan Blue Goku and Vegeta arrive. Gohan thanked his father, but Goku told his son that he should be the one thanking him. That Kamehameha was really something else. He'll take it from here. The battle against Frieza, likewise, is a little easier for Goku and Vegeta, as they all begin this in their final form. Ultimately, Golden Frieza is defeated, similarly to the original story. The Universe 6 tournament would also have a few changes, as the lack of Majin Buu means that they need an extra fight. Though Gohan does have a conference to attend to, Goku is a lot more insistent on Gohan coming to the tournament. After all, he is their third strongest fighter, and there is no one that matches up to him. Gohan accepts, only if Piccolo joins too. Gohan was contemplating missing the conference anyways in the original. Once they arrive at the Super Dragon Ball, Gohan gets the highest grade in the exam, so the teams are balanced out, unlike the original. Goku still battles and defeats Potamo, but is defeated by Frost thanks to the poison. But Gohan's been training with Piccolo and some with Goku, and he's able to stand up against Frost. He takes off his glasses and bursts into ultimate, looking only at Frost's arm. He knew exactly what the trick was here, and avoided Frost to the best of his ability, before blasting him out of the stage. The Mageta fight is also a lot tougher for Gohan, and I could see him losing. Despite his constant training, all of these fighters are a challenge for Gohan. He isn't exactly super Super Saiyan Blue Goku level. The Mageta fight is also tougher for Gohan, and I could actually see him losing. But then again, Gohan also insults his opponent when he's sure of himself. If he calls him an ignoramus, like he did against Super Buu, then Gohan wins and moves on to the Kaba fight. And Gohan would surely be interested in this brand new Saiyan, asking a lot of questions about Planet Sadala, and accepting Kaba's invitation to come visit one day. But Kaba is ultimately defeated, and he doesn't teach Kaba Super Saiyan. Instead, Vegeta promises him that he will visit. And teach him what a real Saiyan can do. This means that in the Tournament of Power, the Universe 6 Saiyans won't exactly be as powerful, at least not at first. Gohan's fight against Hit is as far as he makes it. Though he is able to understand the time stop a little bit as the fight goes on, he's just not as powerful as his father nor Vegeta. He can predict where Hit will move and how, but is ultimately 
eventually knocked out. In the end, the tournament ends similarly to the original. Since Vegeta got to watch Gohan fight Hit, he does a lot better against him, actually pushing Hit to the ropes. But in the end, it's up to Goku to try and defeat him. But Goku being Goku, once he realizes that neither him nor Hit can fight all out, he gives up. Next up is Piccolo, but they both kinda know that this is not going anywhere. And Hit just steps out of the ring, hoping that he can fight the Saiyans one day. Gohan is also largely uninvolved during the events of Goku Black, and things go on as normal, though when Trunks goes to visit him, he is glad to see just how happy he is with his new family. Yet, he also recognizes how strong he is. Trunks doesn't want to get Gohan involved, he couldn't stand seeing his master hurt again. Zamazu and Black give our heroes an incredible amount of trouble, even fusing into merged Zamazu. It all seemed lost, until when the Z Fighters got a single chance to breathe, Goku brings up the idea of the Potara. Last time he fused with Gohan, their powers skyrocketed to an incredible degree. If Vegeta and Goku fused, then surely they will be able to stop Zamazu. Vegeta hated the idea of fusing with Goku, but if they knew the Potara weren't permanent, then he had an idea. Vegeta grabs the Potara, and Goku smiles, but Vegeta stops him. He says that if he is to fuse with anyone, it should be Trunks. He has defended and saved his world previously, and it's his duty to do it again. Vegeta says, This isn't our future to save, Kakarot, but what I can do is help my son. Goku thinks that's a great idea. He's going to distract Zamazu in the meantime. Trunks and Vegeta place their Potaros on. The future prince is born. Goku tries to dodge through various blasts, but as one giant one comes his way, Vegjinx slices clean through it, landing before the Kai, sword in hand. Zamazu takes a step back, the sheer Dragon Balls on these mortals, using a godly artifact to try and match him, but their power won't be enough. That's when Vegjinx smirked. I'm just here to show you how mortals can reach the same heights any god can. The fusion of two mortal saiyans with immortal pride, Vegeta and Trunks. I am Vegjinx. Bursting into Super Saiyan Blue, the fusion threw the sheath of the sword at Zamasu at incredible speed. The god had just barely enough time to sidestep it, but Vegjinx appeared over it, grabbing the sheath as he headbutted Zamasu, with him spinning the god and throwing him up to the sky, followed up by a heat dome attack, which burst through the side of Zamasu. He could barely keep up but began to fight back to the best of his ability. Unbeknownst to him, a massive amount of Genki was being gathered in the broken sword. Goku couldn't believe it, but Vegjinx could actually turn the tide. Zamasu rushed his way again, firing blast, but Vegjinx jumped over them and fired a burning impact. The combination of the dirty fireworks and the burning attack exploding Zamasu on the spot. Vegjinx descended with a smile, circling the fusion. It was time to finish this. Zamasu rose his energy, Keyblade burning at his hand. Vegjinx place his sword on the sheath, slowly circling around Zamazu. They knew whoever landed this next move would be victorious. Zamazu was brimming with rage. As Vegjinx watched for the slightest movement from Zamazu, the god took the smallest breath and began to step forward. That's when Vegjinx unsheathed his sword, a near blinding light escaping as the Sword of Hope revealed itself. Vegjinx ducked under Zamazu's sword and swung. It was the one thing he had over Zamazu speed, and in that instant, the Sword of Hope sliced clean through the middle of Zamazu. He whipped the sword down, staining the floor. How is it possible for mere mortals? There's nothing mere about us. Vegjinx sheathed his sword once more, as Zamazu's top separated from his bottom, a blast of light exploding from it. Zamazu was defeated. Everyone ran to the fusion as it diffused, but they were out of the frying pan and into the fire, as Zamazu spread through the universe. With a heavy heart and no real other options, the team was forced to retreat as Zeno was summoned, the fate of the reality sealed. With Trunks and Mai given a new timeline, the countdown for the Tournament of Power began. This time, Goku approached Gohan directly. He knows that despite being so busy, Gohan has continued to keep up with his training, especially after the Universe 6 tournament, where he realized that if it wasn't for how smart he is and his experience, then surely he would have lost against many of those opponents. He needed to focus more. They were far harder fights for him than they would have been for Goku and Vegeta. Goku doesn't keep the secret of what could happen to the Universe if they lose away from Gohan. Instead, he uses it as encouragement, even if Gohan was mad at him. As the chosen leader, he helps Goku choose the fighters, helping recruit Piccolo and Tien. Gohan also suggests Yamcha, but Goku isn't sure. He'd rather take a chance with bringing Frieza back. Gohan heavily disagrees, but they could use the power. During the tournament, Gohan's training made him a formidable foe, taking down way more enemies and even surviving the Dispo encounter and defeating him, going off to fight Jiren alongside his father and defending him while his father
father recuperated, jumping in to help when Goku falls to his knees in pain after obtaining Ultra Instinct. Gohan defends his father, with Seventeen joining in as he reveals that he was actually alive. With their teamwork, Gohan and Goku's father-son combo is able to finally push off Jiren off of the arena, powered by anger and the desire to protect his family. It felt like when his father's encouragement helped him defeat Cell, Jiren began to understand a deeper trust, a familial trust, one he realized he shared with the Pride Troopers. Zeno cheers and congratulates Android 17, but the Grand Prix declares that the tournament is not actually over, as one more contestant remains. The whole crowd goes quiet in anticipation, as a Death Beam flies in and strikes 17 on the leg. 17 falls to his knee, as Frieza reveals that he had been hiding. Since Gohan was there to help Goku defeat Jiren, Frieza took the chance to just stay hidden the entire time, until the end of the tournament, where he was sure to defeat 17 and make his wish. 17 vs Frieza is only allowed because Zeno thinks this is fun. 17 is far more hurt than Frieza, and the Emperor instantly gains the upper hand. Everyone cheers for 17 as whatever wish Frieza was going to make would be no good. In one incredible rival punch, both 17 and Frieza are nearly knocked out of the arena. 17 knows he has to win. Frieza may not be able to sense 17, but he can sense him. 17 used everything to his advantage, especially his unlimited stamina, as he confused Frieza by speeding around him and firing blast. Frieza thinks that he has missed them all before realizing that it's a trap. Seventeen had blasted the area he was standing on, essentially cutting it off of the ring. Frieza falls. Seventeen had won, but at the very last second, Frieza throws out his tail to drag Seventeen along with him. The android tries to catch on to the edge, but it's too late. Seventeen and Frieza fall out of the arena. Everyone stays quiet in shock, looking at both Seno. Was he going to destroy them all? But no. The Grand Prix said that Universe 7 had won. They just had to agree on a wish. Everyone worries about what Frieza will want, but he agrees with the group wish. He knows what they want. Surprised? You shouldn't be. After all, more universes means more for me to conquer and own. And so, the tournament of power comes to a close, with Beers congratulating Gohan on a job well done as a leader. He will surely remember him, unlike the manga where he forgets his name. How come he never came to train at his planet? Well, he was never invited. Either way, he had more important things to do. Take care of his daughter. Goku looked at Gohan with a proud smile. He always knew he could count on him. Everything was well, until the adventures against Broly. The movie plays out more or less as normal. At that point in the original, Gohan was still fresh off of the Tournament of Power. If he didn't bother helping in the movie, I doubt he would hear. And even if he did join, it would only be as a way to distract Broly, while Goku fused with Vegeta. And we'll say that they meet a lot sooner, since Gohan is training a little more with his father, making good friends with Broly, and helping him control his strength. Just like in the manga. Speaking of it, the Moro arc begins when Miras and the Galactic Patrol arrive, they quickly realize that Boo is nowhere to be found, and instead look towards those that defeated him. Goku and Vegeta are training together, and they agree to help against this foe, though Goku also calls on Gohan, as Boo wouldn't have been able to be defeated without him. According to Miras, Boo was their only hope to stop Moro, but Goku and Vegeta smirk. They know that whatever it is, they can handle it. Without Boo, Miras has a chance to explain exactly what they're facing. Moro, a dark wizard who can absorb the energy and power from not just the planet, but those in it. When they eventually find out where Moro is heading, Goku and Vegeta discuss what to do. And unlike the original, where Goku and Vegeta teleport away by themselves, here Miras doesn't have to wait for Boo. So instead, they all teleport together to Planet Namek. Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and Miras appear. Once there, Miras and Gohan help the Namekians hide away the Dragon Balls. It wasn't long until Moro arrived. With the warning from Miras that he can absorb their power, the Z Fighters are more than ready. But there is one caveat: Vegeta still wants to make immense for what he did to the Namekians, so he insists on fighting alone. But at least, he begins the battle a little more seriously, straight into Super Saiyan God. But tomorrow, this just means more power to absorb. Eventually, he starts to look younger and younger, and that's when Miras realizes that he was indeed using the power absorption on the whole planet. Vegeta turned into Super Saiyan Blue, but it didn't last for long. A lot of his power had already been eaten. It was obvious that if this continued, then they wouldn't be able to win. Gohan said that they had to rush and Moro together. Vegeta complained, but Gohan didn't listen. To everyone's surprise, neither Goku nor Vegeta could transform anymore. Moro had grown far too strong. They needed to get out of there and recuperate. They'll only die at this rate. But they couldn't just leave the Namekians. Miras knew that he needed to help them escape, but Goku doesn't have enough energy to teleport. Miras steps up to Moro, who's surprised to see a simple patroller try and challenge him. But Miras avoids every single one of his attacks. Goku is mesmerized, since it looked like Ultra Instinct. As long as he just avoided, he would still be okay. Gohan gets an 
idea to save Namek, stealing one of the Dragon Balls. If they took one of them, then Moro wouldn't be able to use them at all. Moro gets wind of this and rushed after them, but Miros keeps getting in the way. Gohan gets Murray and Eska before pouring whatever little energy they had into Goku. As it turns out, Gohan had the most energy out of all of them left. Goku tried to get the other Namekian warriors, but they refused to leave and would rather die with the planet. Goku promises to bring them back and apologizes, getting as many Namekians as they could inside of the Galactic Patrol spaceship. Goku thinks that Miras is ready to sacrifice himself, so as he teleports the ship, he also catches Miras while he fights Moro and appears at the Kaioshin realm at Gohan's suggestion. It's a place Moro can't reach under normal circumstances. Realizing that they took one of the Dragon Balls, Moro explodes in power and goes on to absorb the power of the rest of the Namekian warriors and Namek itself, yelling at Cranberry that it's time to head to Earth once he interrogates one of the Namekians and realizes that there's probably more Dragon Balls on Earth. However, he has a few stops along the way, including absorbing Planet Zoon. Shin and Kibito heal them, while the old Kai is angry that they brought so many people along, but he understands that Moro is a threat. Vegeta takes the ship with the patroller to Yardrat. Goku goes on to train with Miras, while Gohan decides to train with Piccolo on Earth, warning him of the impending threat. Before he leaves, however, Gohan asks about the Potara. They help them save the world a few times before. Perhaps they will again. The Z Fighters don't have as much time as the original, since they know Moro is on the loose and is heading straight towards Earth. Piccolo realizes now how far behind them all he is. Gohan tells Piccolo that they need to make sure the Dragon Balls are used, so that Moro won't be able to make his wish. Piccolo wonders what to use them for, and decides to use it to get his potential unleashed. Piccolo's power is incredible. The other two wishes are used to restore Namek and revive those killed. After going to a couple of planets and sucking their energy dry, Moro tells Cranberry that he has an idea. He may not be able to wish for all his magic, but all the power stolen from those worlds has really pushed him forward. Even so, he believes that he will need more help. In the original story, it took two months for Moro to get to Earth, slash six months inside of the Galactic Patrol chamber. Instead here, something around two weeks have passed, and though progress is being made, it's not nearly enough. The Z fighters may be a little unprepared. That's when Moro's ship appears above the Galactic Patrol prison. Some ships notice it, but before they can do anything, a lot of guards and even prisoners begin to feel weak. Moro gets an even further power boost before letting go of a tiny key ball that blows away nearly half the prison. Guards and prisoners are sucked out. As the blast shields came down, Moro didn't need the Dragon Balls to free his men. Chaos erupted in the prison. Jacko contacts Gohan about this, and with the help of the Kaioshin, him, Piccolo, and a handful of Z fighters teleport to the prison. They try to restrain many of the fighters, but some seem to have been powered up. None of them are as strong as someone like Sagambo in the original, since Moro himself isn't as powerful. But this is still an issue. They try to fight Moro, but their power keeps getting stolen. Piccolo is doing his best against him, landing crazy punches, but eventually not only does he go back down to base, but he feels 7-3 grab his nape and absorb his power. Gohan tries his best to keep fighting, debating if to use the Potara, but the other prisoners are becoming troublesome. Mir also caught wind of the attack, but continued to train Goku for as long as he could. Goku does have a better grasp of Ultra Instinct, but he wished he could have more. Goku and Miras teleport in. Instantly, Goku bursts into Ultra Instinct against Moro, and actually begins to beat him fairly well. However, while Gohan fights against 7-3 and eventually brings down his enemy, Moro takes the chance to eat him. Sadly, his only power absorbed is Piccolo's, but that potential unleashed gives him a huge power-up. It seems like Miras has to step in, but Goku and Gohan continue to team up against Moro. Eventually, Gohan suggests the Potara, which surprises Miras. Goku doesn't want to do it. He wants to use his own power, but with Moro absorbing his energy, it may be their only chance. Suddenly, Vegeta appears. He knocks Moro to the side and continues fighting, stealing energy back from him. Moro can't believe it, but all he has to do is continue to steal it back. He tries to absorb power from the environment and everyone, but Goku laughs, saying that he chose a bad place to attack. He may have had the advantage on Namek since that was a planet, but here it's all metal and machines, nothing to steal energy from. Goku and Vegeta team up against Moro, with Moro powering up as much as he could, but the prison begins collapsing on itself. He was moving the entire space station with sheer aura. It begins to catch fire as Gohan and Piccolo help out. Vegeta thinks if this keeps up, then they're all going to die. Piccolo yells at Goku that he needs to fuse with Gohan. Gohan throws the Potara 
Ararat Goku, but Moro blasts both earrings. Goku uses Ultra Instinct to catch it just in time, but Gohan's goes flying out and landing at the feet of Vegeta. Vegeta curses, he knows he has no choice, but they both look at each other and nod. After all, they fused into Gogeta once already. Vegeta places the Potara on with Goku, while Gohan and Piccolo continue the fight, getting their powers stolen in the process. But it's too late for Moro. Ultra Instinct Vegito is born. The incredible power of the fusion was amazing, as his hair burst into a silver color instantly. The Yardra training of Vegeta and the training with mirrors for Goku, it created the ultimate fighter. Vegito easily dodged and weaved away from all of Moro's attacks, while striking and seeping out all of Moro's stolen energy. It was to such a degree, and with such force, that it actually seemed like he was aging again. Vegito could sense all of the energy he was stealing back. Namek, Gohan, Piccolo, and more. Moro tried to counter, but Vegito's incredible speed and rate of fission was too much. From the world of the Kais, Shin and the Elder Kai watched the battle go down. Shin cheers happily. They had seen a powerful Potara fusion before, but nothing like this. The old Kai interrupts, saying that it's not just the Potara, but Goku and Vegeta living to outdo each other. Vegito is the ultimate result of that, the man who is always one step ahead and the man who refuses to be left behind. Moro was getting desperate, and he tried to attack Vegito in several ways, but with this being a spaceship rather than a planet, Moro was at a severe disadvantage. Gohan and Piccolo poured their own energy into the energy sphere. The Galactic Patrollers too helped out. Miras was awestruck. A desperate Moro screamed out and tried to reach for the energy. If he gained it back, then he would actually be able to stand a chance. But as he did, Vegito appeared in front of it as it began to merge itself with the fusion. He whacked a finger before Moro, with the wizard having no option but to try and escape. But if he couldn't, then he would take them all out with him. Miras yelled out that they needed to get Moro out of there. He was going to self-destruct, but Vegito was engulfed by the energy from Moro, his aura expanding. Moro had his back against the the wall, as he gathered energy into himself, ready to self-destruct. But before he could gather enough power to explode, Vegito simply pulled his fist back, jumping forward and launching a powerful punch of energy. Moro tried to attack back in desperation, but it was too late. He was launched out of the prison and into the ether, as the dragon fist opened its mouth and disintegrated the monster. The threat of Moro was gone. The stolen energy slowly returned back to its worlds. Now they could bring back those killed by Moro, and the prisoners returned to their cells. They were too scared to even try anything. Vegito looked up to the atmosphere with a smile, a twinkle of the dragon fist fading away as he defused. Miras remained with the angelic power, owing everything to Goku and the Z Fighters. Peace could return again, as Goku actually got the chance to train a bit more with Miras. Even Vegeta did, though his path forward was clearly not meant to be Ultra Instinct. And so, a few more years pass on by. While Goku and Vegeta Vegeta trained at Beerus's planet, Piccolo was attacked by Gamma 2. This Gamma 2 is actually somewhat weaker than the one we know in the movie, since the Moro battles did not take place on Earth. But Gohan continued to train with Piccolo, who could keep up easier with him now that he had his own potential unleashed. Not only that, but they've added a new training partner, Pan. Though Gohan is extremely busy with work, his habitual training prepared him a little better to spend time with Pan. He knows that if Goku and Vegeta aren't around, then the world will depend on him, and there is no better motivator to stay on top of things than Pan. Piccolo is also more accustomed to the potential unleashed form, so when Gamma 2 attacks, he actually puts up a fair fight. But Piccolo is smart. Even if he could beat him now, he needs to find out how, why, and where the Red Ribbon Army was operating from, allowing Gamma 2 to think that he lost by ripping his arm and leaving it on the floor before sneaking out. Telepathically, he contacts Gohan, who is about to pick up Pan from school. Piccolo tells Gohan everything, the Gammas, Magenta, and what appears to be a new Cell. The plan is still to kidnap Pan, so Piccolo heads out there to do that. But the Red Ribbon soldier is actually horrified to find that Gohan was already there, waiting for them at school. Now he will take them back, but not before dropping off Pan with Bulma. Just like in the original story, Gohan and Piccolo arrive at the Red Ribbon HQ. But instead of Gohan needing motivation to burst into Ultimate, Gohan and Piccolo arrive in their potential unleashed form already. Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 stand no chance. Their combined teamwork, in addition to their well-trained states, meant that though it was not 
not an easy fight, the Gammas were quickly subdued. Gohan demands to know why they attempted to kidnap his daughter. The Gammas' resolve began to waver. Were they really in the wrong here? They did try to kidnap a little girl, didn't they? This just seemed like an angry father, rather than a terrorist. That's when Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 got a call on their communicators. Magenta had freaked out. He saw them losing and questioning the Red Ribbon, and now was attempting to release Cell Max way too early. They had to stop him, otherwise the whole world could be in peril. It was obvious to the Gammas that they needed to put a stop to this. Gohan, Piccolo, Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 burst out towards the location of Cell Max, and Gohan was instantly in shock upon seeing him. He quickly snapped out of it. They appeared in front of Magenta, slapping his hand away from the button. They weren't going to just let him release Cell. The Gammas were disappointed and declared that he must go to jail. But as Gohan and Piccolo come to terms with Hedo and reprimand Magenta, they heard the sound of a roller coaster card coming down. Gunshots were heard as Gohan appeared before Hedo, blocking the shots with a single finger. Piccolo then appeared by the car and lifted it off of the tracks. It was Carmine. But Magenta took the chance to jump and throw his whole body onto the console station, short circuiting it and releasing the liquid from Cell. He was freed. Hedo cried out in fear. This Cell Max had no morality or sense of justice like the Gammas. He was just a crazy, murdering machine. But while everyone else freaked out, Gohan and Piccolo remained calm. They were all confused, terrified, as Cell slowly made his way out. He broke free from his restraints, coming down to look at Gohan in the eyes and roaring in his face. But Gohan simply smirked with Piccolo. Didn't think I'd see you again. You should have stayed dead. In a flash of light, Gohan and Piccolo both burst into their brand new states. Orange Piccolo and Beast Gohan. The force of their auras was such that Cell Max, the Gammas, and all the others were pushed away. The Cell Lab began to fall apart on itself as Cell recovered just to see Gohan and Piccolo charging a pair of special beam cannons together. Let's make this attack count, Gohan! Right. Special beam! Cell Max lifted his arm up in desperation, creating a key ball as he flew out of the area. But it was too late. Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 appeared behind Cell Max, coming in with a double kick to break apart Cell Max's wing and slowly bring him down, giving Gohan and Piccolo a clear target. In a single shot, Cell Max was defeated. The heroes gathered all those within the lap and flew out of there as the Red Ribbon HQ was destroyed in Cell Max's explosion. The Gammas apologized and promised to take care of Magenta and Carmine. Just then, Bulma arrived. She brought along various fighters, but they weren't needed anymore. Even so, Pan ran out of the ship happily to see her dad. Gohan shook his head at Bulma for bringing her along, but it all worked out in the end. Hedo did wonder what those forms were. He had no record of them at all. All. Gohan smiled as he explained, in order to keep up with the amount of work he has. While at the same time not neglecting either training nor pan, he had been using the time chamber to work and get ahead. When Piccolo found out about this, he insisted on training with him there, in order to not misuse the chamber. Not only that, but Goku and Vegeta's recent progress with their ultra forms inspired them to try and reach something even greater. They trained extremely hard, pushing each other to the edge over these past few years. For Gohan, the answer was clear. His anger had always been the source of his power, but what if he could pull back right before reaching the apex? Control the anger, rather than let it control him, as he described it in the manga, boosting up his key just up to the point where he might snap, while still maintaining control. That was the key. Gohan had learned the lesson his father instilled in him long ago, when he was forced to fuse with him. Humanity must protect itself. His father won't always be around. Gohan can enjoy his life, his studies, his friends, his family, but he must also remember if the world ever needs him, he must answer the call. Gohan and Piccolo smiled at each other. And that's where our story leaves off. As you can see, in my theory, Gohan and Goku fusing actually has an impact on Gohan himself. It's not to the same degree as other stories have done, such as what if Gohan continued training after the Cell games, where he is the focus of the story. Instead, it just planted seeds in Gohan's mind, keeping training always on the back of his head. I hope you guys enjoyed. This was one that I've wanted to do for a while. A huge thing Thank you to Foxkeys over on my Discord server for the design of Gokuhan and Vegex. A huge thank you to the patrons of the channel who get to watch videos like this early. And if you're looking for more Dragon Ball content, then be sure to look out for the full story of What If Piccolo Got Orange Early.